and welcome to another jacked up episode of Straight Chilling, the weekly horror movie review show where you chill and we kill, slice, dice, and chop up yet another horror movie. My name's Bob. I'll be your host for the evening. This is episode number 338, recorded Sunday, September 26, 2021. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the movie Jack O from 1995. This was chosen by Matt G. Thank you so much, Matt, for showing us some love over on the Patreon and picking a flick for us to review. Before we get into the review, let me introduce everyone else on the show tonight. First up and last up, we got our boy, Randu. What's up? Pumpkins. Get right used to that bump, because this is the week, baby. We're getting all all of the pumpkins this week. There's no avoiding it. I love it when you pumpkin. The the alternative is to (laughs) use people saying things like, like, oh, man, I just J-O'd. It was great. Oh man, I just watched. I just got some Jacko. It was it was a good time. I'm really calm now. Jack, like, I don't have those bumps. Oh. What an unfortunate name for a movie, Jack, dude. I know. And also confusing because that is not what the title card of this movie says, which I know is not totally uncommon in horror. But man, they did not really do a whole lot of favors for themselves, did they? No, no, they really didn't. Uh, as you probably have noticed, Soju is out for the week. He went back to Korea, and uh, I think they found out that he was talking such mad shit about the representation of Bon Mi sandwiches in Halloween 2018, and they threw his ass in Korean jail. He's probably going to stay there for life. It's hundred dollars at night. <laughs> it is. That's what he's worth over there. Hundred dollars at night. That's what he's worth. Um. <sighs> But uh, before we get into the main event, talking about Jacko, let's get into some housekeeping, of which there's a decent amount. Uh, there's, this is your final reminder, because this is the last episode of the month of September, uh, to get your votes in for the October poll pick, which is currently posted on our Patreon website. If you support us at the $5 level or above, you get the chance to vote on a movie we're talking about this October. The theme for October is classic horror movies. Three movies to vote between are Carrie, Child's Play, and Psycho. Blurb! <laughs> Blurb! Yes. Coffin Daddy? Yes, that is me. Tell me what the numbers are. What are numbers? Numbers are consistent. Carrie's in first place, Child's Play is in second, Psycho's in last place. Uh, Damn. Yeah. Norman is spinning around right now, just ain't itching to get out, but Sorry. Right round, baby. I, mean, I, I think, right round. dude, I don't know. I guess like I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the choice of carry. I mean, all of them are good choices, but to me, it seems like I would have picked psycho probably personally. Yeah. Uh, th- they want that De Palma goodness all up in their ear. I holes. guess so. I mean, you know, the last De Palma we did was uh, dressed to kill. I guess it's time for one that, that doesn't require so many asterisks. <laughs> Still probably a, <laughs> quite a few, but fewer. Actually, yeah, that's probably that's fair. <laughs> that is fair. <laughs> uh, yeah, looking forward to Carrie, assuming that wins. Make sure you get your votes in before October 1st. We'll see what we're talking about. Um, we do have a brand new Patreon supporter. We got to give mad shouts outs to Ryan G., Thanks for signing up on Patreon and showing us some love. Every dollar you guys contribute goes right back into the show. And as is tradition around these parts, we owe Ryan the straight shilling salute. Here we go, sir. Yeah, my ass. Mm. Thank you, Ryan. We appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um, yeah. You help pay for my rental of Jack O. <laughs> And, you know, take that for whatever it sounds like to you. It was <laughs> worth it. And we'll we'll get and into I just watched that. Jacko and man, I am so calm. So Jack. I am just whew. Jack O's face is the name of the movie. Um uh, Big thanks to everybody that hung out with us for Elvira's 40th anniversary. Very scary, very special special, which was on Shudder. 
uh, yesterday, as of uh, the time of this recording. Uh, it was pretty cool to see Elvira back on the screen doing what she does best. Um, and uh, as is uh, Shutter tradition, Joe Bob Briggs is doing another thing on Shutter on uh, Friday, October 8th at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. He's doing his last drive in double feature, um, and we're going to be doing another live watch for that. So mark your calendars Friday, October 8th. Friday, October 8th, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Eth. Yes. Friday, Eth. Friday the Eth. Friday the Eth. Um, what else do we have? God, we got so much. Fuck my ass. Fuck what my else? ass. Uh, we're doing a uh, chillo ween party. This is our first, yeah, ever, we are. first ever chillo ween party. Uh, we are hosting it. Ooh. We are hosting it on Zoom, and this is a Patreon only event. It's going to be taking place Friday, October 15th at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to be playing some horror trivia. We're going to be screening a surprise horror film, and we're also going to be hosting Mm -hmm. a costume contest. So make sure you're doing your horror trivia homework and you're dusting off your sickest Halloween costume and get ready for our first ever (sighs) Halloween party. Dude, I am stoked for that. You know, I, I, I don't know why, but I got this crazy urge to make me a banh mi sandwich that night. What do you think? It might be a banh mi kind of night. Do it. I'm going to make banh mi sliders so I can eat them all mm. night long. You know what? That might dominate the conversation, though. I guess that's fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> Indeed. It wouldn't be the first time. Probably not the No, last. it would not. Uh, I think that's all we got for housekeeping. You have anything you want to add there, Randu? Oh, just this. Pumpkins. As usual. Thank As you. usual. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get into the main event. We're talking about Jack O, and we're kicking it off. You never Dude, allow me to clean house. I uh, I'm in, I I don't know. I got to get my head out of my ass. Dude, sir. your house has not been. You, you're, you got hoarder it's, syndrome going so on. Filthy. Your house is so filthy. God damn. Ashamed. What's on the back of the box? <laughs> I'm a premature bumper. You might have noticed tonight. <laughs> yeah, no worries. No worries. Uh, it's just all that Jack O. Jack O. We're jacked up on Jack O tonight, courtesy of Matt G. Uh, this movie is from 1995. Runtime of an Boy, hour. Boy, does it look it. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Runtime of an hour, 28 minutes. Um, this was directed by Steve Latshaw, stars Linnea Quigley, uh, Madison K. Crown, Gary Doles. And also, uh, it's got some other folks that are like not well. John Carradine and Cameron Mitchell are in it, kind of. We'll get into. Oh all yes, of that. yes. <laughs> um, plot synopsis is as follows. Um, I've got the box, but there is not a plot on the back on the back of the box, so I'm not going to be reading that. <laughs> well, you got the collection. I guess that's yeah, fine. the Jacko and Friends collection on DVD <laughs> and Friends and Friends. So the uh, plot brought to you by IMDb says, A long, long time ago, a wizard was put to death, but he swore vengeance on the townsfolk that did him in, particularly Arthur Kelly's family. Arthur had done the final graces on him when he came back to life as Mr. Jack the Pumpkin Man. The Kellys proliferated through the years, and when some devil-may-care teens accidentally unleashed Jack O, young Sean Kelly must stop him. Somehow, as his suburban world is accosted and the attrition rate climbs. Well, thank you, IMDb. Uh, that is... Did you say something about racism in there, or did I mishear you? <laughs> no, I did not say anything about uh, racism. They really sounded like you said, and he must... Like, I don't know. There was something in there that sounded like racism, but doesn't at all. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this movie, man, this, yeah, this movie well, is not like filled with actors, so... It's, I guess to speak to your your talk about actors, Linnea Quigley is by far the biggest name in this thing. So that is very very true. Um, Randu, had you seen this movie before? Would you recommend people check it out? Absolutely not. This is actually a very difficult movie to see. Right? I mean, Jesus Christ! The fact that you own a hard copy is is fucking Herculean, as far as I'm concerned. It was hard enough to find any legitimate stream, and it was available on Amazon for the paltry sum of $2 because it is the most I have ever witnessed. I don't know how it looks on your, your DVD, but my God, it looks like it was directly pulled off of a VHS player. 
Um, so yeah, uh, I would not recommend this film. Um, I would say that if you had a good time with Birdemic and you want the Halloween version of that, but less interesting, you might do okay. But otherwise, this is not a movie for for anybody, really. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, this was a uh, first time watch for me. I'd been familiar with this movie, um, but I didn't know that it was filmed in Apopka, Florida, which is like just north of Orlando. So that definitely like piqued my interest. Um, uh, and I, I was pretty excited to watch it. So I did, as Randy mentioned, I, I picked up this uh, DVD copy of it and it's got three movies on it. It's got Dark Universe, Biohazard 2, and Jacko, and it's called Jacko and Friends. And um, other than this DVD, you can only get it on VHS as far as physical copies go. But yeah, I mean, you can rent it on Amazon for two bucks. So it's pretty pretty easy to find there. Um, I recommend watching this movie, but not because it's necessarily, really? it's not a good movie. It's, it's, it, okay. It's got like some really great Halloween. Pumpkins. Yeah. It's got some great pumpkins. It's got some great Halloween aesthetics to it. And it's, mm-hmm. it's got some like early nineties charm. This is, this was a movie that was shot and went like straight to video um and apparently that's where most people saw it was like you know video rental stores on vhs i think it did show sure. on tv as well um i don't know how unless they i mean they had to cut linea quigley almost halfway down out of this film <laughs> yeah no shit but uh it's it's got some like early 90s charm to it and it's got some interesting lore and like the creature is fun it's just it's like a big dumb fun movie um Mm -hmm. but i I will say like if you are interested in purchasing physical media i cannot recommend enough buying this dvd of jacko and friends oh god (laughs) And I want to, I want to, I want to mention this at the top. Qualify that, please. I will. Yeah, I, I want to talk about it at the top because we're going to get into it uh, throughout the show. So there is a commentary track uh, on this disc for Jacko, and it, it it's between the director and executive producer. Um, it's uh, Steve Latshaw, who is the director, and the um, the executive producer is Fred Olin Ray. And they really lay into each other. Like it's the commentary starts off, starts off pretty amicably, <laughs> and, but you can tell there's like some tension going on, and they start taking some digs at each other. And as the thing progresses, it's it's like more dramatic than the movie itself is. And it's it's it by, was a marriage to the beast. <laughs> it's the best commentary track I've ever heard in my life. I can't <laughs> recommend it enough. I really can't. <laughs> Like I want to qualify this myself because you started texting me when you started watching this and you just didn't stop texting me about it. I don't know. I was so desperate to see this thing now. I was doing some last minute research for this movie. Like I I finished this commentary like 30 minutes ago. Like I just finished it. If I had like finished it in midweek, I would have mailed you this disc so you could have watched it, man. Like it is worth it. I don't know Damn. how they released it. How did this get put out? I don't like, I don't know, <laughs> dude. That is literally the exact question you can ask about every single fucking facet of this film. So yeah, that's, that's true. I don't know. I, I recommend Why would the it. commentary be any different. I recommend it, but just know it's like not necessarily a great movie. I don't think it's necessarily a bad movie, but it's not, it is not great. Um, so it's, yeah, qualifying. Yeah. It's, I mean, you're right to say that it's got some, some Halloween's ha- Halloween vibes to it. And it does have just the slightest bit of like nostalgia to it yeah. but for me anyway, but it's like, it's hyper specific nostalgia to the point where like, like the lead kid in this movie is about our age at that time. So like there's a little, and it's from our neck of the woods. So it just kind of seems yeah, like maybe yeah. an unfair amount of nostalgia that nobody else is necessarily going to have. That's probably true. Um, it's also got Linnea in it. And you know, if you're like a horror buff, it's always cool to see her in something. And this is like a Halloween well, like centric, Linnea, Halloween centric movie. It's like well, off completest. the beaten, beaten path. You know, so that's it's got yeah. some some worth there anyway. Anyway, that's our recommendations. Let's go ahead and drop the spoiler <laughs> warning and we're gonna get into the rest of this movie. Here we go. Spoiler warning. Alrighty then. 
What do we say? What do we do? I do have a plot synopsis typed up. I'll go ahead and blast through this, and uh, then we'll talk about it. So the movie opens up with little Sean Kelly hearing about the legend of his ancestors burying the evil pumpkin Jack. We see the events happen in a flashback, and then we jump into present day 1995. Uh, We see three kids throwing rocks at a car. Uh, Vivian driving the car. She gets out. She walks over, and she sort of uh, helps protect little Sean Kelly from uh, these other two kids. They're kind of bullying him. She ends up walking him home. Uh, Vivian, which is important to know, is a complete stranger who very quickly befriends the Kelly family and agrees to help them with their home haunt on Halloween night. Uh, Miss Kelly very quickly. And yeah. It's really a matter of like three sentences. Yeah, it's it's immediate. It's a given. It's like they're best friends and they always have been. Yeah. Uh, Miss Kelly then calls up Carolyn, who's like a teenager, and she asks him to ask her to take a Sean out trick or treating because uh, uh, they're going to be busy running the haunt and then she can't do it herself. Uh, she agrees to do so until 10 p.m., at which point she has a party to attend and her sister Julie will take over. Uh, three teens find the old Oakmore Graveyard. They remove a wooden cross, which awakens Pumpkin Jack. Uh, They are all slaughtered. Sean then has a dream where he sees Vivian, and she's related to an old warlock. This is confirmed to be true when Vivian shows up the next day with her family Bible, and it has a picture of the warlock in it. Uh, Warlock's name is Walter Machen. Vivian shares that Walter was accused of witchcraft in 1915. Before he was hung, he swore revenge, um, and he took his revenge in the uh, the form of the evil Pumpkin Jack, uh, who was eventually stopped by the Kelly's ancestors. Uh, Carolyn takes Sean trick-or-treating while Julie and her boyfriend Jim drink beer in the woods. Sean's parents run the home haunt until Mr. Kelly gets a call from a concerned parent saying their kids saw some dead bodies. The Kellys and Vivian then go out to find Sean and Carolyn. Vivian says, only the fifth Kelly descendant can kill Pumpkin Jack, which is... Oh, yeah, it's a prophecy. Which is Sean Kelly. So Sean is the only one that can can kill pumpkin jack that's Uh, the prophecy that's it that's the one pumpkin jack kills jim knocks out carolyn and starts burying sean in a grave very slowly with his scythe Uh, vivian is killed sean has a flashback of his descendant stabbing pumpkin jack with a wooden cross sean holds up the wooden cross while his father shoves pumpkin jack into it pumpkin jack explodes Uh, julie (laughs) carolyn and the kelly family meet back up and head off to have a lovely breakfast the following morning roll credits well and but then there's a jacko head that starts lighting back up as if i i was true man yeah can i tell you of all of all the crimes that this movie commits and it is ample um an ample amount. I would say that the editing is just so fucking confusing in this movie. This is not a com- really a complex, but the editing really makes it kind of feel like it is. I don't know if you felt that having to write the synopsis. I was sitting there like, God damn, who, who is this now? Like they introduce so many fucking characters and there's like at least two Judd Nelsons in this movie. Like there's two Judd Nelsons and a Tia Carrere and they kick things off without names. Yeah, this is, <laughs> A movie like if you want to fully understand what's happening in this movie, you do have to kind of pay close attention to it. And at the end of the day, it's not a very complex plot. It's just how they choose to like put the information on screen for you. It's not very yeah. linear. You get like a couple like info dumps, but mm-hmm. like there there there's like a sentence here and a sentence there. Like if you don't latch on to very quickly, like you might be a little confused as you see what's going on. Well, and then there's shit like, okay, and I know I realized that this was like an intentional moment of confusion later, but it's like too fucking confusing. When um, Sean is walking into his house at one point, like early in the film, this is when we get to see, um, what's his name? Carradine, I believe. Uh, He walks into his house from the the outdoors where it's sunny and where like Vivian and his dad are talking about the haunting house or whatever their haunted house that he's putting together. He walks inside and it's, he walks into a front door and on the other side is a little lobby side area, a little foyer, and then an outside door leading to a darkened outside forest and he like like when that happened, I was like, "What just happened? Did they just cut an entire scene out of this? Is there just like, did they just remove an establishing shot? What the fuck is happening?" And it turns out he's having some sort of like vision or dream or yeah, whatever. I think it's a dream, yeah. But like that kind of shit happens 
all the time in this movie and not and like i don't know like it feels like there's probably two or three d- dream sequence moments in this or things that they chalk up to dream sequences and i really just think it's like uh how do we get from a to b just fucking call it a dream sequence and we'll be done <laughs> do you get that sense what do you think about that yeah it's it's a little jarring and I think some of that is due to the fact that when they made this movie, they had pre-existing footage of Mm -hmm. John Carradine and Cameron Mitchell. And the, the, because they were passed at this point. Well, I think so. John Carradine was like eight years gone. I think, I don't know Mm -hmm. if Mitchell was dead at the time of the release of this movie, but he definitely did not shoot any new footage for this movie. That's no, that's for damn sure. Um, I think they both were posthumous in this, but like, at least that's what I read. And, and like Carradine, like that's footage of Carradine. It's supposed, it's integrated into the film as if it's like happening in the film. It's like, it's not like, like, um, the other one where it's, it's like an insert on a TV. You know, where you can say like, but the quality is severely worse. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Carradine is so noticeable. He's playing the warlock and there's like a green light over his face. And it, it looks like they took footage from another movie, but apparently like the footage used in the, in this movie of both of those actors was never used in any other movie. It was just like literally footage they had laying around. And the producer was like, put this shit in this movie so we can put their names. Yeah. Just for the name recognition is really why, um, I don't know if that worked for him or not. Maybe it did. I, I don't know. But it, it'd be weird to see this movie coming out. Like, if you were a big, like, fan of John Carradine and you knew he died eight years ago and then fucking Jack O comes out, like, would yeah. you be stoked to see it or be like, fuck these guys, you know? I, I mean, I might be until I saw it. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> very like, oh, forced. It's that like, was a mistake. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that shit was filmed in the 80s and it really shows quality wise. Like, if nothing else, like, you take everything else about it outside and disregard it, it is noticeably different f- film quality. <laughs> and it's like, it, it's that's why I like compare this movie to Birdemic. That is the only movie I've seen that seems comparably incapable at doing basic things about filmmaking. This movie is better than, than Birdemic is. It does have, like, it doesn't have any sitting on top of your dash cam footage. Um, but it it does like it does really fucking hokey and like bad things that I feel like there's a little bit of a charm to it. I must say, like there's a little bit of a charm to the fact like this seems scrappy. You know what I mean? This feels like yeah, like yeah. like the the residents of Rainy Street on King of the Hill putting together a, a horror movie. You yeah, know? the f- the footage they used of except Lania Quigley's there. <laughs> <laughs> the, the footage they used of Carradine was shot for a movie called Cannibal Church, which they ended up not using. And the footage they shot of Cameron Mitchell was supposed to be in a, mo- be in a movie called Terminal Shock, but I guess ended up not being in that. Um, yeah, they had Quigley on set for three days, and they just, like, I guess, shot everything they could with her within three days. It feels like pretty well-established. Like, her character is well-established, like, throughout the course of this Better movie. Better than most, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that might have something to do with her being like a little more on the professional side of things. Like she'd done a shitload of, of movies, you know? Um, I did. Well, she, like she was an actor. I feel like there were a lot of yeah. non actors in this movie. Like even yeah. like you expect yeah. that with the kids, but I feel like maybe the dad and like, um, I don't know who else, like, like both Judd Nelson seemed like non actors to me. Uh, Linnea's sister seemed like a non actor to me. The fucking Walton couple, the Walton, was it Waltons? I think so. Are you talking um, about the like super Republican? The, the hyper, yeah, the hyper like, conservative, conservative, like TV yeah, yeah, consumers. Yeah. 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 I like, love those watching, characters. Like, pro- <laughs> Dude, they were pretty funny and it's clear that they were like intentionally funny, but it yeah. was like, yeah, it, it was almost quaint seeing what, <laughs> seeing uh, yeah. a social critique on, um, very conservative Mid-90s people. Mid-90s conservative yeah. talk radio types because Compared now it's to like... now, yeah. Yeah, it's that, so much more insidious now. <laughs> the uh, the producer definitely intended that to be like a playoff Rush Limbaugh, that, like the talking oh, head yeah. on the TV. I love that shit because they're like, they got the microwave... Uh, TV dinners and it's like this gnarly ass Salisbury ma- steak. Like, it looks <laughs> disgusting. Yeah, it does look the- bad. And like, and they're also like, like insanely over the top, like, like evil. Well, not evil, but like just 
petty fuck bags. Like when trick or treaters come to your, their door, yeah. First thing uh, the guy does is he says, "You didn't turn off the porch light," and she's like, "Must I do everything?" He says, "Yes," and then he goes and answers it and yells at the kids that if they want candy, they got to pay for it and all this shit. And it's like nobody's that <laughs> fucking evil or shitty to kids on Halloween, and if they are. Like they don't then immediately go inside and expect nothing to happen. Of, like, of course you're going to get TP'd. Of course you're going to have shit on like people fucking with you. Like, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I love it, that sequence where he's like, if you want candy from me, you're going to buy it. Like, yeah. Get the fuck out of here, man. Yeah. Like, the only characters that you see like that in, in, in most Halloween stuff are people like uh, weirdly like in King of the Hill, they have one like this. It's like a hyper religious, like, like this is a satanic holiday sort of thing. Like people that are morally religiously opposed to it um, for better or for worse. That's, those are the people that get to act like assholes in Halloween movies a lot of the time. Yeah. But not just like people like a, a dude is just like so hyper, like libertarian ass. He's like, you better work for that. can it's like, this is, fucking halloween dude. no handouts you never here, kid yeah exactly the no handout thing. It's, it's so like it, it the thing is it might be one of the more clever things in this movie which is sh- just showing how low the bar is for cleverness here <laughs> yeah yeah those uh those two characters were based off real people uh that i guess the director live next to somewhere oh over, my god he in just orlando which is <laughs> unsurprising to hear Oh, is that how believable is that? <laughs> yeah. Um, oh boy. Regarding the uh, some of the other cast and how it's it, you kind of feel like they're probably not very seasoned actors. Something kind of pretty interesting happened regarding the casting of this movie. Um, the uh, uh, the Donahue show in the nineties. They had a scream queen contest on there. I guess. Really? And, yeah, they had three judges, and um, Fred Olin Ray, the executive producer of this movie, was one of the judges. Uh, Barbara Feldon was a judge, and Joe Bob Briggs was a judge. No and shit. They, uh, I guess there was a bunch of girls that were having trouble sort of like breaking into the business, and um, they, they auditioned uh, on this Donahue show, and Kelly Lacey, who ends up playing the character of Shannon, ended up winning. Um, so she's in this movie and hypothetically it's like her first movie role. So I think she did like one thing. Is, is that Lania Quigley's sister? Who is that? Um, it's yeah, I think so. Shannon. Yeah. I think that's, that's the only like no, young woman Julie. besides me I can think of. It's another, it's one of the so, teens, one of the teens. Oh, oh, she was probably, she was probably the Tia career dressed fucking Judd Nelson third at the beginning that took the, uh, cross out of the ground. I, I would think that's the only other like young woman I can think of from this film is, is those three. And she, I, we know it's not Linnea. She obviously didn't leave much of an impression. So. Yeah. Well, like, very little. This movie kind of slides off the dome on, in a lot of ways. It, it can do that. It can do that. I don't know about you, but I did fall asleep uh, at least once during this film and had to rewind. <laughs> um, oh, no. Yeah, I didn't fall asleep at all uh, watching this movie, but I also like, I don't know. I was just awake i wasn't tired at all like i don't know regarding mm. you mentioned earlier how this was sort of like re- reminiscent of plan nine from outer space because they sort of like stitch in a bunch of like pre-existing oh, yeah. stuff to, yeah. to beef it up and the the producer i guess was giving this interview in fangoria when it came out and he referred to it as plan nine from out of state which i think is pretty fantastic <laughs> <laughs> out of state <laughs> sure well, I mean, that's that's a play on Plan 9 from Outer Space, but I have no idea what that's supposed to mean in a literal sense. I assume because it What's was... What's out of state about it? It's a Florida production, and it wasn't shot in California, is what I was assuming it meant. Oh, okay. Yeah, that does make sense. Then. Okay. All right. Got uh, it. That is yeah. clever. I like it. <laughs> it also had... Speaking... Like, if you are familiar at all with the Orlando area, it had its world premiere at the Enzian Theater, which I thought was pretty badass, even though it's not that's like awesome. the best movie in the world. That's pretty cool. That's um, a damn good theater. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They play good shit that it's not always... They don't just play Jacko there, in case you want to check it out. <laughs> they... T- <laughs> what a shame. Just round the clock Jacko, and they missed out on that. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so I don't know, man. There, I I was sitting there watching this movie, and I was like, I'm gonna struggle to have stuff to say about this. 
except to compare it to things like Birdemic and Plan 9 and stuff. This is like clearly a bad movie, right? Like like on its base level. The question I was confronting with was how enjoyable is it? Because I, that is the only thing that can really sway a bad movie into a positive score for me. Um, which obviously yeah. we're, I'm not t- asking for your score or anything like that, but I was having trouble even doing that much with some of this. I feel like maybe if it was a, like, this is another one of those cases where if it was, I was in a room with you guys or with, with other people, it could definitely have benefited from that. Did you get that sense as well? Yeah, I definitely think so. It's the movie's not like quite bombastic enough to hold your attention, such as a birdemic would be. Um, it does, it's got a lot of atmosphere, like I mentioned, and it actually reminded me quite a bit of Pumpkinhead. This is like, cause there is a, another like vengeance demon in this movie, just like in Pumpkinhead, but the yeah. demon actually has a pumpkin for a head, unlike Pumpkinhead yeah. does. So it kind of delivers on the, the yeah. title in a way that Pumpkinhead never did. And there's a witch that's kind of forced into it, you know? Uh, but I think this would be served uh, to watch in a group setting and not necessarily on your mm-hmm. own because it's a little, it's eh, like, thing you is said, like yeah, it's kind of forgettable, I guess. It's kind of forgettable. It's like I think it's because like like it. Is, I think that, I mean this movie has kills in it. it like mm-hmm. <laughs> Birdemic didn't have as many as much of that going on as it did. Like really dumb shit. Like I don't know. Like fucking hanging out with your family or whatever. Like there's a lot of. Are there's not a non not not insignificant amount of like what would qualify as gore and stuff like that, and you would think that would hold your attention, but I honestly think that the way it's edited so confusingly and the way that the story is like is confusingly relayed makes it harder to focus on. <laughs> like you don't even have like like in Birdemic, you get it, it's like okay, so there's birds attacking people, got it, and you can focus on that one aspect and be good. And this one, it's like okay, a pumpkin-headed guy is chasing people. But they like so much of it is dedicated to the why, the how, all that stuff, and it's not engaging really, and it's confusing. Yeah, there's there's like some interesting stuff they inject in into the lore. Like at the beginning, it's got a very like John Carpenter's The Fog vibe, where uh, Sean's sitting around mm-hmm. campfire hearing about this evil Jacko yeah. and there's even like a little nursery rhyme kind of thing. Like Mr. Jack will break your back, cut off your head with a whack, whack, whack. And it goes Dude. on and on. That's like pretty, that's another one though. You know, yeah. I agree. Like that's, that's, I mean, it's a little paint by numbers, but it's yeah, fine. Yeah. It yeah. would work fine. And on like just saying, Oh, they have a crazy nursery rhyme. They make up. That sounds kind of menacing. And like that, all that all is fine. That's by numbers, but it's fine. The problem is that like, at least with that part is, I'm pretty sure that later on there's another fucking nursery rhyme or something. I think they do like three different things with it. Apparently it seems it's like long like, as fuck. Yeah, I guess, but they act like it's a pre-established thing. I have no idea. Maybe it is, and those are just like lines from the thing that like, that seem disparate because they're it's like super long. Like you said it seemed like they were like occasionally like like one character will start reciting stuff. I'm like, what the fuck are they talking? Oh, is this? This isn't the same rhyme, though. What is happening? They should have. They could have just stuck with like two or three lines that are menacing, and made callbacks instead of confusing. Fucking. I think they're trying to make callbacks to that thing, but it's really just strikes more as a non sequitur to something else entirely, or like an entirely different spooky thing to say. Yeah, that doesn't really hang together with what's going on. I, I don't know. That shit was weird. <laughs> I enjoy. I did enjoy that, even if it was a little like inconsistent. I also got a kick out of like the parents like Sean's parents, like getting really into setting up their like home haunt in the garage pumpkins. And the dad's like hanging a little banner and he's got like crazy amounts of fog rolling. And he's got one of those old school little like things you hang from the ceiling. Mm -hmm. That's like motion activated and it makes a crazy wild noise. Yeah. It's like a witch and shit. And like, and they do the fucking, that is like the most rinky dink and they kept calling it spook house, which I am like, yeah. I guess that's a common phrase, but I've never heard it called that just like a haunted house. Like it's a spook house. That just seems kind of old timey. I, I didn't hate that. I just thought that was kind of, kind of unique, but um, they also do the thing with like the eyeballs, the guts that are grapes yeah. and spaghetti and all that stuff. And it's like, man, this is like the world's rinkiest dinkiest fucking ha- haunted house. And, and like, there was something kind of charming about that, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, you're not that into fucking Halloween, dog. Like, I don't buy it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't buy it. I want it to. Like, it seemed like 
okay, like a dad that's like hyper into Halloween, uh, the mom that's hyper into Halloween, and they they do this thing or whatever. You would think that that would be great for a movie that's centered on Halloween, like this is supposed to be and is for the most part. But it just seems like, and I think it's budgetary. Like it's clear, it's got to be budgetary that they couldn't do like an actual kind of like haunted house even on a small scale. I've been to haunted houses that people do in their garage. Even the like bad ones are more than fucking spaghetti and grapes. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. We had this guy know. in the neighborhood when I was a kid, and he he wouldn't make like a haunted house in his garage. He'd just open up the door and he'd fill it with fog. And he had this like really badass like, gorilla costume that was like head head to toe, <laughs> and he'd put that on, and he built like a little cage for himself, and he'd like crawl inside of it, and he'd have like you know fog and strobe. <laughs> <laughs> he'd make noises like that and when kids would walk by he'd like run out of the cage after him down the street and scare the shit out of him it was pretty badass that's it's amazing simple, simple, that's amazing but yeah yeah and that's really simple and but like i've been to things like where people go all out like like somewhat all out not like mckamey manor shit but yeah like like you know relative like people like they have a storyline to their fucking thing where it's like oh my kids are playing the scientists that unleashed a zombie horde and now there's zombie children chasing you and they're pinned up oh no they escape like they're trying they're trying real hard and i just it's hard for me to sit here and be like yeah this guy really gets the spirit of halloween because he set up fucking grapes <laughs> he's trying he's a dad That's, he's in a movie filled with nothing believable that might be the least believable part <laughs> There was this really awkward scene between the dad and Quigley where she's like, Oh my God, dude. Complimenting him on his like his childlike wonderment. And he's like, Oh, well, thank you. And she's like, yeah, I like little boys. (laughs) It's like, dude, that whole scene is, they're really trying to tap into like, they're like, Lenny Quigley has her, her, her reputation as a sex pot in movies or whatever. Like that's like, like there is, (laughs) <laughs> there is a nude scene that goes beyond shameless in this movie of her where man, like, I don't know, but like those sort of things they're, they're, they're using her for that. Like, I think that they kind of like back off of that when, when she gets around the kids, thank God, but like they do that. And then he does this thing where the kids like, Oh, look at the cool bi- motorcycle. Can I go look? And he says, look son. And then he looks over at Linnea and he goes, but don't touch like he's desperately tempted by this yeah. woman. And she's just sitting there smiling at him with her Linnea Quigley face. And it's like, I don't know. I appreciated it. But at the same time, I was like, this movie's too stupid to support this. I feel like this is a movie that could be for kids, but it can't be because there's so much Linnea Quigley titty in this. Yeah. So re- regarding the like very unnecessary amount of nudity in this movie like so we're we're like introduced to quigley's character in the shower naked mm-hmm. it's lingering it's yeah. unnecessary it's uncomfortable um, they do a sh- cut away like she's like facing cut it's kind of like oh you see her from one side in profile almost and then she turns to face the other way to go into the other profile and as they do that they cut to a close-up one shot of both boobs as they turn to the other side and then cuts back out. It's like one second of just boob shot. It's just like nothing but, and they do that with the other girl too. So I want to, I want to mention this commentary real quick regarding this sequence. Oh my God, please so like, do. Uh, the director, Steve <laughs> Latshaw, whenever this pops up on the commentary, he's like, yeah, I mean, you introduced to the character when she's naked in the shower. And he's like, you know, I, I called you talking to the executive producer, Fred Olin Ray. He's like, I called you, Fred. And I was like, you know, I don't know if this is really the best way to handle this character. I mean, you're introduced to her and she's naked on screen. And his res- his response apparently was like, as it should be. He was just like all about it. And like, like oh there's God. obviously a lot of resentment uh, uh, from the director about that scene being in there and like Linnea just like being so unnecessarily naked as she was in a lot of movies, but still yeah. it's, it, it's super cringy in this movie. It is very cringy. It's like, it's so my, like, like uh, there's no pretense to it whatsoever. Like there's nothing about it that isn't just, We want to see this woman's boobies, her yabos, and we're going to allow you to see them for an extended period of time. You paid the admission cost. We owe you some nice boobies and that's it. Like there's nothing. I mean, it's, it's, it's unpretentious. And in in some ways I'm kind of respect that, but on the other side of things, it's like, this is this movie like is maybe only suitable for Halloween viewing for you and your kids. You know what I mean? Until you get to that shit. 
Yeah. <laughs> that during the the commentary, that's the first time the two of them say they are done with each other after they're done with the commentary. Like Oh my they god. Say it several times. What do they say exactly? Like you got to relay this like g- g- give me a, s- set the scene and they're, go. They're um so uh, the movie starts off and they're saying some interesting stuff, particularly the, dir- mm-hmm. the director Latchaw saying some interesting stuff about how like the um, Arthur Mockin, like the warlocks character was like named after this writer with the last name of Mockin, who is similar to HP Lovecraft. Um, apparently like the, the main house in the movie was literally Steve Latshaw's house. That's like where he lived with his that family. That shows. <laughs> um, his, Very much shows. His son is playing the little boy in the movie. So like he and also his family shows. are like very personally entwined in the making of this movie. And like, you can tell that Latshaw is sort of like, he's proud of the movie, but he's not like boastful. And he's, he's not under the illusion that, that, that this is like an incredible film. I think he just kind of, yeah gets a little extra flack for some of the decisions that he was forced to make by the executive producer. And there's some tension that obviously is between them. And like, as, as it starts, you think it's because of that explicitly. And then as it develops, they start taking digs at each other's craft more and more. And then they start taking (laughs) digs at each other's families and it becomes extremely personal. Holy shit. The last like <laughs> 20 minutes of this commentary, Latshaw like fucking leaves. He fucking gets up and <laughs> leaves. Like there's uh, Gosh, I, you fuckers at a bad time. Uh what are they I got I have so That sounds amazing. I, I don't know so why that's not in Why is that not available for for immediate viewing? I need to see this shit. I mean, like, well, the fact, oh my God, this is, this is like, this is a Florida man movie. Is it not? Uh, I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to label it like that. There's, I'm <laughs> okay. trying to find this one quote. I have so many notes. It's hard to like read and also like relay what I'm It's just got that relay. salaciousness to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, there is like one review of this where I guess somebody calls, calls the movie like a shit pickle. I don't like, <laughs> and I, I guess that was a like, shit pumpkins, a shit pickle. And apparently that was like a really, really sore spot for the director. And a, like, it was agreed upon that before they do this commentary together, the producer would not bring up that review. Like he made oh him agree God. to it and he brought it up towards the end anyway. And he that that was the breaking point where he's like, "Fuck you, dude! I'm getting out of here." Um, but then he ends that up coming hilarious. back. He does come back a couple minutes later. He's like, "You know what? I'm not gonna let you totally fuck up this commentary. Like, I'm gonna finish this thing out, regardless." You know, and he does, and he tries to like throw in a couple extra like interesting tidbits and shit. And then at the very end, <laughs> um, the the producers like. He's like, you know what, man? Like, we've been friends out here for a long time. We've done a lot of work together. And the director's like, no, man, we've been acquaintances out here. And the producer's like, okay, well, then fuck you. And the director's like, fuck you, too. And that's literally the end of the commentary and the credits roll. That's how it that ends. Is, that is so much better than this movie. Why, why am I missing out on this? It, there's The drama is palpable between these two. It is... There's a nuts. hidden Jerry Springer episode in this fucking movie. There is, man. I I couldn't believe it. I can't believe they put this shit out, man. Um, there's <laughs> like yeah. the producer said, I have so many quotes. I have so many fucking quotes. The producer was <laughs> like, you know, Roger Corman expects his directors to take a certain amount of responsibility for what you turn in. And uh, Fred was like, yeah, but at least you have Roger Corman stories to tell afterwards. <laughs> like, he's... <laughs> She's like so fucking salty. Um, I don't know. Oh man. my god! It's they say <laughs> it's over several several times, and there's like so. I guess they they got back together to do this commentary, which was specifically for this DVD that I have. And the producer's like, <laughs> he's like, you know what? Who the hell else would be putting this thing out other than me? He's like, nobody would do it, man. Like, that's why you're here. We're here to put this movie out. We're here to put your movie out, even though it's been called a shit pickle. Like, 
<laughs> like he's he's trying to do him a solid. Obviously, it's like a cash grab. No. Like, it's the only reason he's Dude, doing it. Dude, yeah. This, like, yeah, I'm doing you a solid. Sure. Yeah, yeah you're fucking welcome. Um, <laughs> the, God damn. That is so entertaining. The, the So these both, both these guys kind of feel like cooters. The, I will say the producers like extra fucking cootery. He says <laughs> shit like, you know, don't drink and drive. Cause hey, hell you might spill the drink. <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> he's the one that like insisted Quigley was like nude in the movie. And like you yeah! needed to introduce her that way. And he, there's like this one sequence in the movie where I can't remember. There's like teens like making out in a bed and he's like, Oh, there's that famous Fred Olin Ray bed. I guess it was like literally his bed. And he's like, man, the, the long list of actresses I could tell you that been laid down in that bed. He's like, hell, I thought about auctioning that bed off on eBay. Like you wouldn't believe the Jesus. names. It's just, it's pretty cringe. Uh, I hate that. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, it, somewhere towards the middle after like after the producer like really making some digs at this movie he turns around and he's like he, he's like you know what man like i i think this is actually one of your best movies <laughs> and the director's oh like what the God. fuck do you mean by that like you just spent 45 minutes telling me his shit basically it's it's pretty rough um, dude oh man there was That's... something there There was like some interesting ideas going on regarding the promotion of this movie though some of it I already mentioned like the donahue shit um mm -hmm. in addition to the like fangoria interview there was also like a uh, uh jack-o-lantern carving contest in which you would carve your shit and you'd send in a picture to fangoria and linnea, linnea quigley would actually judge and she like picked her favorite i don't know what the the prize was necessarily <laughs> But there's yeah. a contest going on with that, which is kind of neat. Um, uh, it's sort of not surprising to hear that uh, the producer, Fred Owen Ray, was a broadcaster at a Christian radio station in Apopka, Florida, when he was younger. <laughs> My God. Yeah. My God. Uh, this is how are you how do you i mean you don't want to put the label of florida man near this you don't <laughs> no i don't like the stigma i think that's kind of bullshit okay. because dumb people do shit in every state so people think no that's true florida I mean, is yeah. dumb because florida man is dumb dude you don't have to like convince me but at the same time like the, the fucking the crocs fit baby they fit well these people both <laughs> live in california now well, so, I mean, dude, that should have, that's have like, for like producers years. and directors fighting in California. Unbelievable. Yeah, California. Unbelievable. Man. California, California man says, says from waitress to diva. Thank you, Fred Olin Ray. What a shitty thing to say. <laughs> like, dude. Um, oh my God. Yeah. I totally hijacked the conversation and I apologize. Dude, I'm glad. That, no, it's fine. Cause it's like, this movie's kind of tough to dig into. Like the, yeah, it's got some interesting lore. Oh, I did want to praise one thing, but like the thing that kept me really interested about this movie was or that kept that 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 brought interest for me was the actual pumpkin head. I thought it looked pretty good for being a low budget thing. What did you yeah. think of that? Yeah, I thought it was a pretty cool design and like uh -huh. the the eyes being sort of like reflective material was pretty neat. And mm -hmm. obviously it makes sense that he would kill people with a scythe, you know, that that's like very very fitting. Um yeah. Yeah, I, I I really don't have any complaints. I mean, it obviously looks kind of low budget and cheesy, but I think that works in the movie's favor. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a negative necessarily. Yeah, I mean, it's by far the best quality thing in the movie, as it should be, as it should be. Like, it should be the most, like, well, I mean, in terms of, uh, of actual physical items, that's the most impressive thing in the movie, I would say. And, you know, the kills are, are, are tough cells. You can see people pushing mm -hmm. fucking squibs out of their in out of their hand out of their onto asses. their neck <laughs> out of their asses no but like you can and like the one dude one of the judd nelsons gets a scrape across his face like claws and it's just like the streaks of ketchup across his face yeah. so sort of look and you know like it's not good but you know it's a it's a low budget movie you just kind of take your lumps with it but with the mask i felt like they really kind of transcended their budget a little bit and it's the only thing in this movie that feels that way yeah i don't know what the budget was for this. It was obviously very 
very small, and that's one of the many mm-hmm. things they bitch about. They're filming in the guy's the house. Commentary. I gotta think it's yeah. pretty fucking small. They apparently they bought all the pumpkins that you see in this movie in the month of November, and they didn't start filming until February and March of the following year. So they just like had to shellac all the pumpkins. And the, yeah. the poor man had to store all that shit in his garage. And he was like, you know, it worked fine. But if, if you put in, if you applied any pressure to one of the pumpkins, it would just cave and you just smell like rotting garbage. Like, oh, yeah, pretty gnarly. Eesh. That's no good, man. That's no bueno. Yeah. So I don't know, man. Like there's something like, like, like scrappy and fun about being able to make a movie like this at all. Yeah. And yeah. part of me wants, I kind of pulled for this movie. I wanted this movie to like really like, like be as silly enjoyable as in a campy way as possible. And I think maybe they were aiming for that in some ways, but just it didn't, it didn't really land for me in that way. To me, it's like, it's like it's, it's hammy in all the wrong places. It wasn't bombastic enough to really hang Mm. a, like a bunch of giggle fests on it. But then again, I haven't seen it with a group of friends. I feel like that really, that's really like the test for a campy movie. And like, there's so many of these movies that we have to review or have reviewed that, that just don't get that test. Cause we're not in the same state. Yeah. This, I do like some of like the goofy electric effects that they have going on. Like when the, uh, the very oh, that's, conservative yeah. lady dies, that's probably my favorite kill. And oh, like, absolutely. I forgot about that. She just like trips on a, and it's a, not even a kill. That yeah, is a, it's that, an is an, that is a freak accident after a kill and pumpkin head just kind of watches. And after she's done electrocuting, he just kind of like kind of homers into the, into the, into the head. She does. just kind of, uh, she like, up. I, I love how this whole scene is set up. Cause they're having their gnarly Salisbury steak and like the, the, male character i can't remember his name the 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 dude goes to answer the door and he yells at the kids about how they can't get candy or whatever and she's like dear do you want a second helping of toast and it's like god damn you people eating a lot of toast yeah i'll make you some more toast and they yeah okay go ahead i'm sorry i cut you off and she (laughs) she's loading the toaster down and she she's buttering that shit up and, and slicing it up and she trips on a rug and she's still got the butter knife in her hand and she falls butter knife first into a toaster and gets electrocuted mm-hmm. to death but like it's got this really cheesy thing. overlay that looks like lightning happening all over her body i mean it's the same effect technically that they do in like ghostbusters and shit yeah, like that yeah. it's a matte painting but it's not done that well obviously and it's but it is done well like again i think you're right i forgot about that and i would say that that rises uh, above that kind of floats to the top in terms of, of um quality in this yeah. movie yeah um but i will say like that whole scene i loved i actually did kind of love the killing of her husband <laughs> because he goes out and there's like all this toilet paper and he's his, they've been rolled or whatever and um or maybe it's, i think something else happens but like he hears the jack lantern guy and he's like ah aren't you a little big for trick-or-treating and then the thing kills him and um mean as he's getting stabbed in the gut or whatever or bleeding out of his mouth or whatever they're cutting between that and the lady buttering and cutting toast really meticulously yeah like the opening of dexter or some shit and i was like man this like it's clearly to my mind it's like well we can't sell the gore that much but we need to fill this out so we're gonna imply the gore via toast of all things like they could have had it be a roast or something they could have had it be something with blood in it But they chose fucking buttered toast. And I think it's because of their commitment, I guess, to making fun of his neighbors being like the most, like in the words of this movie, the most white bread of all time. Yeah. It's, it's pretty solid. There's another decent kill. Um, uh, Jim gets his head like chopped clean off and then Julie catches it as he's like rolling across the ground. Oh yeah. Freaks out. It's a real silent night, deadly night moment. Yeah, dude, it really is. Uh, that's a pretty solid kill. Those are the ones, those are like the two that really stand out in my mind. Most of them are just slices across the neck that yeah. you can buy at Spirit, the Hall- Spirit of Halloween store. So Yeah. That goofy um, ass sequence where like uh, Sean is getting buried with a scythe and it's taking four fucking ever. And he's, yeah, he's like, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh my God. That kid, so the bad. kid actor, like, I mean, he's not an actor. He's just like the actor's kid and all that stuff. So, I mean, you know it's fine i'm yeah, this kid yeah, is yeah. fine I, i'm not i'm not giving the kid shit except like he's not an actor and it very much shows because he's like he's slowly getting co- it's like watching that scene from austin powers where the guy's slowly about to get run over by a uh, fucking steamroller 
He's like, no, except he's not even yelling loud. He's like, no, no, please, please, no, <laughs> please, no. <laughs> it's like he's like this kid cannot cannot ramp it up at all. Like he just really shows nothing. Everything he says is very like read off a cue card. But what's interesting is same is true of his dad. His dad kind of yeah. seems like he's reading off cue cards too. No, well, they probably were. Uh, man. I don't know. They probably were. I mean, do what you it's, gotta it's do. It's that thing where it's yeah, it's that thing where it's like, oh, this is bad, but is it entertaining? And I can't. I don't know. I, I have a hard time deciding. Yeah, yeah. That that aspect of it. I mean, the uh, when the kid goes trick or treating, somebody gives him like a little juice, like a little container. Dude, of yeah, juice. one of those like little barrel juices. Yeah. What the fuck? <laughs> like, who hands those out on Halloween? I don't know, man. What people get weird on Halloween? Like that's. <laughs> Thank God. I don't. Remember. I remember getting. Fu- there were people that gave out toothbrushes like fucking monsters in our neighborhood. Growing yeah. up, like before, I, yeah. I remember and that's getting like, the little like Bible pamphlet. That was the worst. The chick tracks. I don't, is or that what it, it's called? I don't know what it's called. The little comic book things, or it's like yeah, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely those are chick tracks, most likely, and yeah, they're they're hilariously nuts. But I, I, I definitely got a few of those growing up um, in my in my Halloween bags, and that's the shit that's like. Man, you are really asking for people to get mischievous on your house. I mean, kids are looking for an excuse. Mm-hmm. Give me a reason the to hell shit you think on your car, <laughs> and I'll do it. Give me a reason to leave a dog shit in a bag in front of your house, and I, I'm, I'm, I have the dog shit in hand. It's just a matter of picking a target. Why paint that on your back? <laughs> Give me a reason, um, you old bag. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much, yes. Um, endless Mike style. So I don't know, man. It's just I don't know. I don't know yeah. where I was going with that, really, but yeah, I don't I know lost either. The thread on it. Is it well? I mean, we can go and rate this thing, man. Is there anything else you want to touch yeah. on before we do so? No, man. It's tough to think of a lot to say about this movie, so no. Okay, well, let's go ahead and do it. Out of five, how do you feel about Jack O? So, um, I, I mean, I've been pretty, pretty upfront about this. Is a bad movie, and really, what it comes down to is how enjoyable it is, um, as opposed to the quality of it. That's what happens with most camp movies. And, and in our situation, or at least my situation, it's a little tough because I don't have a lot of like horror fan friends where I'm at um, that can come over and we can all giggle at a bad movie together and enjoy campiness on that level. I just like, I don't have that resource here. So for me, it's just me kind of like nodding off because I can't even like crack jokes to somebody and have them crack jokes back and laugh back and forth about it. So I'm missing that component of it. I recognize that. And I feel like, this and a few other movies that we've talked about pretty recently would benefit from that greatly. And I may have to try it again at some point under that, under that rubric. But the experience that I had with this movie was I did not enjoy it. I like, I kind of liked the lore. I thought the mask looked good. I did like some of the effects and a couple of the kills, like a few things, like I said, rose to the top. They were the cream of this movie and they definitely seemed there were only a handful of things that really kind of came out feeling like cinematic at all. Uh, on any level and the rest really was like really bad acting really like confusing confusing as shit editing and um maybe an overburden of exposition that was part of the problem as well and then like some of the actors themselves like the, their performances are not just like wooden like the lady who plays vivian like i think this is a character choice or whatever she's like kind of like clearly trying to conceal stuff the whole time so she's never like she's rarely like just you know normal like she's rarely act she's always looks like she's trying to convey that she's concealing something and the way that she does that is by giving a face like she's sniffing dog shit (laughs) constantly through this whole fucking movie she's got this this dog shit sniff face and i'm just like ah man this is cringy and then the dad's like very wooden and he has the worst haunted house of all time and we're supposed to buy him as i don't know all these things kind of like work in tandem to make it hard to focus on. And then also like an overabundance of characters. They didn't even fucking kill any quickly or any quickly, quickly sister. Like I thought that everybody was going to be a red shirt except for the family, you know, and they, there were a surprising number of survivors in this movie and it really didn't have to be that way. It really like they really could have done with some paring down in general. Um, so overall, I, I don't, I didn't have the enjoyment factor to save this from itself. So for me, it's a 1.5. And a lot of that is 
because I really did like that mask a lot. And I also like, I still see some scrappiness in this. It's tough to make a movie at all. And it's tough to make a movie when you have no budget and you're having to film in your own house. There's something endearing about doing that. And it's, it's tough to ding somebody too hard for those sort of things when they're really coming at it from almost like, I don't want to say that amateur, cause that's maybe like a little, little mean, mean spirited sounding, but at least from an amateur level of budgeting, budgetary construct constraints excuse me you know i think they could have done better with maybe more budget but they also had some severe lacking of prowess in just about every other category that really for me just did not really land in any way i'm sorry to say right on i feel pretty positive about this movie even though it's not particularly fantastic um I really dig the like Dr. Cadaver sequences, which was, um, Oh yeah. We didn't the, even uh, talk about that. Yeah. The Cameron Mitchell, like interstitials where he's like on the TV hosting like a horror show. Like, uh, I don't know. I, I dig that. He's like a, a goofy little horror host. Um, the, uh, super Republican, uh, talking head on the TV. I thought it was hilarious. Um, the, the couple watching that were hilarious. The, the tote, the toast death scene. Um, I dig a lot of the lore happening, even though it's a little like chopped up and unclear and they made like a little nursery rhyme, which was, was decent. Um, some of the kills were good. It's, it's definitely got some like straight to video nineties charm that I vibe with. I just kind of like that aesthetic. Um, the parents are goofy. Uh, it's like a fun Halloween watch, but everything is noticeably like low budget and hurried. It feels very hurried and almost haphazard. Uh, and it really does detract from the enjoyment of the movie overall. Like there's no amazing performances in this movie, like at all. Um, I think they're just trying to make do with what they had. And like, I definitely appreciate that, uh, sort of run and gun, um, hustle that you have, that you have to make, you have to have to make a movie like this. It's not easy to do. Um, and I definitely love, 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 love the commentary. I just can't recommend that enough. Please listen to that fucking commentary um, we need we need to get together and do that legit at some point because yeah. i I'm, all, I'm more interested in seeing that than re-watching this movie and testing its metal uh in in the camp factor i yeah. want to see this fucking document this I, commentary i mean this has a riff tracks to it and i would like if i were going to show this movie really? to somebody, yeah I, I would put this on and put the commentary on and be like i don't even care what the riff tracks is like we're watching the fucking commentary <laughs> it's nuts <laughs> Um, I think I'm going to give this a 2.5, just kind of right wow. down, right down the middle with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, your enjoyment did a lot more than mine. I wonder what, how I would have altered if I had gotten the benefit of seer, hearing that commentary. I, I don't know if that would have, I would have factored that in or not, but hopefully we'll, uh, we'll find out one day. Randu. Maybe. Uh, Soju did call in from prison. He's got uh, uh, his thoughts pre pre recorded for us. We're going to go ahead and have a listen to what he thinks about Jacko. What up, everyone? It's your boy Soju coming to you to talk about Jacko. Sorry I can't be on the cast this week, but I wanted to leave a little blurb uh, with my thoughts and overall score. So the positives of this film is pretty much the vibes that it's got. It's got really solid Halloween vibes um, like throughout the monster has a giant jack-o'-lantern pumpkin head um, and it's Halloween. There's kids running around. I like even kind of how it opens up a little bit, telling a scary story around a campfire to a kid. Um like I said, the trick or treating, even the kids, you know, TP in a house, all those kind of things really worked well for me. It was a fun watch for this Halloween season, even though, spoiler, I don't think this movie is very good, but I don't regret watching it. And it was a fun watch since it is the spooky season. Um, it feels 
like older than it actually is. It kind of reminded me of Night of the Scarecrow a little bit, but much worse in its overall premise and acting and and craft, I guess. But it kind of reminded me of that, but it was like came much later. I think this was made sometime in the mid 90s. Yeah, 1995. So it feels like even more dated than that, honestly. Um, the acting in this movie is terrible. It's just really bad. There's so many laughable moments. It's, it's not quite the level of Birdemic, but there were moments where it kind of reminded me of that. There's a scene where the boy is like laying in the grave and he's like being, (laughs) and the creature is just like, (laughs) <laughs> slowly raking dirt onto him and the kid just like no no <laughs> it's like the weakest fucking shit but everybody's like that it's not just because it's a kid pretty much everyone just does a flat flat job in this um the dialogue is just very basic um the lore i've i don't know i kept going back and forth on it Most of the time, I felt like it was too much. I mean, you needed to make this pumpkin creature make some kind of sense. But adding in this kind of like warlock element, witch element, I don't know. I don't know. I just felt like it was kind of too much. And a lot of the scenes are just them sitting around explaining that. Of course, we do get the flashback scenes. That doesn't really help a whole lot either. Um, the scene with the, the kind of teenagers in the woods awakening him. I mean, that was pretty standard stuff. Um, it was, it was fun. Like the monster doesn't look good, but it looks fun. And, um, it was entertaining enough to see this like pumpkin creature rolling around slaughtering <laughs> these teens and people in the town. Like that was fun enough. Um, Overall, though, I just don't think this is a great movie. <laughs> it's it's a decent watch for Halloween, for sure. Certainly shouldn't watch it any other time. Um, but like I said, I don't regret watching it. I had a fun enough time watching it and love seeing all the spooky Halloween vibes. I really dug on that, actually. So Overall, I'm going to give this a 1.5, and of course, I am a man of principle here, so I am going to give half star for the Yabos, of course, old Linnea Quigley. Um, Man, she had to make a ton of money off those Yabos, because we just covered her last week showing Yabos. (laughs) Um, So yeah, I'm going to give it a 1.5 with the half star for the Yabos, so overall, two for Shaboy Soju. All right. No, I the the Halloween vibes are are decent in this movie. I, I do want to agree with that. Yeah, <laughs> that's I, to me that's that is maybe that's maybe like the un, unspoken part that 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 I did like about it. So good call on that, dude. I was looking at the back of this fucking DVD I have, and I guess they they did commentary tracks for all three of these movies, Dark Universe, Biohazard 2, and Jacko. Mm. And there's a fourth feature on this movie that's just not labeled on the front, and it's called Gator Babes. Oh, I saw something about that. It's like a, a student film or something that he did. I don't know. Film. I just Some don't shit like know. that. I got to watch all this. I got to <laughs> listen to all these commentaries. This physical Please media. Th- this is why you buy physical media. This is gold. This shit is gold. Uh, well, I, I don't. So that is not why. I, there's no reason that change I, your ways, <laughs> man. Uh, change your hearts or die with Justin's 2.0. That's going to put our aggregate at a 2.0. Let's go ahead and jump to a Rotten Tomato segment. See what the critics and users think about Jack O. All right, folks. So what we have here is the Rotten Tomatoes segment for those who are new to the podcast. What I what we do here is I'm going to give Rob the chance to guess to the best of his abilities what the critics and users had to say about the film. Jack. Oh, um, unfortunately, because it's, there's no soju, there's no real competitive element to this. And I've already seen the score. So I, I guess we're just going to see how close you can get. Entertain me with your this. game, Randy. All right. Let's start with the critic score. Now I'm going <laughs> to, 
there are two reviews. There are two. Wow. So you have a one in three chance of getting it right. There's no official tomatometer because that's too small of a sample size, but I can do that much math. I have that much ability to be able to figure out the percentage there. Mm-hmm. You tell me what you think the through two critics here thought about this film. Can I have a 50% please? A 50%. Bob, <laughs> you... <laughs> One in three, and you just couldn't get it. You just couldn't figure it. It's a zero percent, Bob. This is a goose egg movie on Rotten Tomatoes. I have we Can ever you, ever come across that before? No. Well, well, usually, like we don't do these if there's like too small True. a sample size yeah. where they don't give a, a an official thing because it's not really fair. But in this case, I feel I felt like it was fun to just see how see what if you could guess it because it seems so obvious to me. I am shocked genuinely in my core rattled that you couldn't sort that both reviewers would say no to this. I don't know. I figured there'd be at least one positive. We have covered so much worse movies than this that have a rating. We like, have so much. We worse. have, but they're like, but I mean, I don't know. Like if you, in this small of a sample size, like yeah. what are the odds that I you're going to get the one in a fuck. thousand people that's going to say, I like this movie. <laughs> I don't know. I would. I like this movie. Well, I'll read the one negative review that's available to read on here and see if it's any good. A cheap horror effort. It has pathetic acting, a jumbled up story and limp limpid pacing limpid. I don't, I don't know that word yet. There are several nice murders and somehow for all its shortcomings, (laughs) the film seems to capture the spirit of the day it honors. It is basically about a guy with a buy. It just says, I think this got cut off in a weird spot. What? And there's a guy with it with with uh, with a bi. I, I gotta think that that's just uh, Rotten Tomatoes cutting him off midway. This is the kind of movie we're talking about here, people. Rotten Tomatoes cannot finish its sentences about this movie. Wow. Um. All right. Now here's the interesting part. There are a hundred plus ratings, and there is an official score of critic or users. I mean, the users of RottenTomatoes.com have spoken between zero and a hundred percent. What do you think? Where do you think this is going to lie? Uh, I, I, man, I think it's going to be negative generally. Not like crazy. Well, maybe crazy low, to be honest. Fuck. Give me a 40. 40%. Too generous. Again, Damn. this is 13%. I'm pulling for this movie. I know you do, but man, the people are not. I'm going to read a negative, a one-star review from the users since we're doing this. Um, watch this train wreck, train wreck for the laughs. This is one of those films that will have you asking, how on earth did this get made? But is so bad that it's impossible to turn away from it, even harder not to laugh at. I will generally disagree, at least in my experience. Maybe this guy had a, had a raucous group, group watching, but I sure didn't. So. Mm. Well, I still win because I'm the only player. Can I get a hell? Congrats. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, you got it. Uh, we, I kind of <laughs> hit a shitload of trivia during the normal review, so we'll go ahead and cruise on by trivia. Oh, fuck trivia, man. Fuck trivia. Nobody likes that segment. That's for oh. the week. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into Cooter of the Week. Cooter of the week. Uh, if you are new to straight chilling, uh, Cooter is a character type. We try to identify Cooters if one exists in a movie we are reviewing. Uh, in order to be a Cooter, there are five character types. You got to hit three out of five. Um, those five are patheticness, overall attire, manipulation, sexual deviance, and um, smug arrogance. Smug arrogance. Thank you. That would be the fifth one. Yes. Do we have yes. anybody we'd like to take to Cooter Court this week, right? Uh, God, let me think here. Um, I, f- I mean, do these- there's not a ton of. Huh? <laughs> do these characters even have names yeah i really that's can we even start talking about any of these characters i kind of want to put like okay here's my suggestion 
the the Judd Nelson in the beginning that that ta- actually is the guy who pulls the uh, cross out of the ground, the one who actually does that physically. Yeah, I would nominate him maybe because he uh, definitely has smug arrogance. My God, that guy is exuding cootery arrogance. Am I wrong about that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I think he does. I mean, yeah. like, like, so does the other guy to some extent, but she, he definitely does. He does the fucking, the fake out scream. Actually, you know what? That was kind of a funny moment of the movie where he, like he's off sca- off camera or whatever. And you hear him scream and the presumption is, oh, he got attacked and killed. And it shows him and he's sitting there like with his tongue out in a really silly way. And I, I thought to myself, I thought it was legit. I thought they were playing it straight. And I was like, oh my God, this movie is really going to go for it. And then he, it was a fake out thing. And I was like, ah, oh, man, that that's worse. I wish that was a legitimate attempt at a dead guy face, but it was, it was not anyway, but I would say that, that, that fits the prototype of, of a cooter, the arrogance thing, the manipulation, maybe to some extent, we don't spend a lot of time with him or most characters. So it's kind of tough to say. Yeah. I'm trying to think of another person that I would nominate. Nobody's like if you are, really coming to mind. Honestly, there's not a strong candidate here, which is surprising to me. Actually, the, the strongest like candidate to me is the executive producer, Fred Olin Ray. <laughs> that's that's the well, that's I mean, out. I'll take your word for it. Based on everything you've said, that, that sounds pretty goddamn arrogant to me. Uh, it definitely sounds like there's some manipulation involved. It's definitely. I don't know what he looks like, so I can't speak to that. Uh, the sexual deviance of uh, the way he approached the Linnea Quigley question might qualify. Yeah. And the comments um, about his bed. Yeah. And uh, going after somebody's family <laughs> on a yeah. publicly released. That's that. I think that would qualify as pathetic. Yeah. I think you have a pretty strong case here. Actually. <laughs> I think that dude's a real life fucking cooter, to be honest. God damn. Um, yeah, I think that, I don't really have any, like the only other thing I could think of was Linnea quickly saying she likes little boys, but I mean, <laughs> but she was talking just, to a grown man. At least she was talking to a grown man and trying to hit on a grown man by talking about how she likes little boys. That's really just kind of funny and like stupid. Um, yeah, that seems like something like a Charlie Kelly would say on accident, like not meaning what it sounds like he means, but you know what I mean? Yeah, I like your um, boyish outlook, your boyish charm, but she said, I like little boys. Which is I like little boys. Not how you want yeah, to phrase exactly. that. Yeah, but that's that doesn't that doesn't compare to like completely shitting on your former colleague's family in a public format. Yeah, that's pretty shitty. <laughs> like, I yeah, Jesus. I'm I want to give this to Fred Olin Ray, Cooter of the motherfucking week. Let's book him. <laughs> I want to do it. Take it for, take it, Olin Ray. You been take it. booked, mother. Fucker. We're going to get arrested. Who's the shit pickle now, motherfucker? Oh, shit. <laughs> pickle. Let's make this like a real person. Who are you calling a cootie queen, you lint liquor? Um, not me. I'm calling you a fucking shit pickle. Uh, <laughs> I think we got him. I think we got him. Let's, uh, let us. Hook his ass. Let us carry on our merry way. It's time to let our hair down. We're getting into what we've been watching this week. Hey, gang, what you been watching? Randu, what you been watching? Oh, my. Actually, quite a bit this week. Um, So one thing I've been meaning to mention for a few weeks that I slowly worked my way through, I could have gone a lot faster, but I decided to take my time with it. It's a show that I've been meaning to watch all the way through for a long time. Short, because it's British, and it's called Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. I might have brought this up in a previous episode, but I finally like got through it, through it. Um, and man, that is one of the funniest things I've seen ever. It, like this is the, this is a, like when we were talking about malignant and talking about stuff, and that's what actually spurred me to go watch this because people were saying, Oh, it's intentionally bad. It's camp. It's whatever this movie, the, Garth Marenghi's dark place is exactly that. And it does it on multiple levels. That's really funny. So to set the stage for people who don't know what this is, it's a British comedy series that's positioned as a eighties, um, medical drama slash, X files, the like monster creature featurey thing. Um, and the way it's, it's Garth Marenghi's dark place. So Garth Marenghi is a character in the show who is a horror writer 
a prolific horror writer or whatever who you with his own money created this show that never got aired because it was too bad. And he's like very exceedingly up his own ass about it. And they intersplice the show. It's the show within a show of the actual hospital and all this monsters and shit with him and the other actors who are characters playing the actors talking about their decisions, talking about the show as if it was commentary on the thing. It's like, so it's got two levels of commentary going on. It is extremely fucking funny. It's tough to describe, but if you go look at it, it's all on YouTube for free. I don't know if it's supposed to be, but it sure is. (laughs) And it's only six episodes. I think they're like less than half hour each. Go check that shit out. It is very, very stupid and funny for those. It's been memed too. like, I know that there was one moment that gets memed a lot, which is Garth Marenghi talking to camera and a, and a, um, cutaway or whatever in, in a behind the scenes interview where he's like, I know writers who use subtext and they're all cowards. <laughs> like, <laughs> I love that. It's so fucking funny. It's so good. And like, I, I'm just going to keep gushing about it pointlessly if I, if I keep talking. I so want to watch it. That watch sounds that amazing. It is truly really, 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 really funny. Nice. <laughs> Please, you will, you will like it. Um, all right. And then I also watched a couple of like in the Halloween spirit. I like I was looking for like kind of off the beaten path ha- Halloween movies, which Jacko kind of is. And I was grateful for that. But also I watched kind of in the same vein two Disney Channel movies that I saw as a child that were in the Halloween vein, which were the famed Halloween town, hmm. which I had seen quite a bit. And then one called Don't Look Under the Bed, which I was particularly interested to watch because I had heard that they stopped airing it because it scared kids too much. Hmm. Um. So I, having rewatched Halloween Town, I was like, I've seen that before. It's it's nostalgic for me, but it's real dumb and silly. And, you know, I, I know that a lot of like the Disney adults and a lot of other people have fond memories of it. It's just not a good movie, though. <laughs> it's, not, it's 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 fine. It's good for kids in Halloween. It's good with the spooky season. It's worth a watch. I would watch it again. I would never write it off. Um, but it's tough for me to like separate that from my own nostalgia. So it's fine. Don't look under the bed is just as bad, but I don't have any nostalgia for it. Um, and what that is, I mean, Halloween town is about literally a town based on Halloween. So there's go- go- ghouls and, and fucking skeletons and witches and warlocks and all that stuff. Just wandering around, like going to Costco and shit. Um, and then in, well, not exactly that. But like, um, exactly that. That's what's happening. Exactly that. Um, and, but don't look under the bed is about a girl who starts seeing a, an imagine starts having an imaginary friend. It's not her imaginary friend. It's her little brother's imaginary friend. And for some reason she can see him and he's doing all these things to like, I can't remember what he's doing, but it's like, it, it's whatever the Disney channel version of killing people in their sleep is that Freddy Kruegering them a little bit um, or make him disappear. Or some sh- I can't remember, but is it, I, I watched this at the beginning, like right after last week's episode. So it's been a few minutes and it's not a very memorable movie in a lot of ways. But um, it's just kind of silly and there's a boogeyman and apparently boogeymen come from imaginary friends who are abandoned. So it's got an interesting bit of lore going on. And I guess the scare, like I was looking for the thing that makes kids that would have freaked kids out. And I guess it was just the prosthetics on the boogeyman because it is a little bit spookier than you would see on the Disney Channel. I think it really to me was like maybe a little overblown. I feel like they just kind of like copped out and some, it got like one too many emails and just like, fuck it. We'll just take it off. We'll just play Halloween town again. So I don't know. It didn't really live up to the band content label, but it is fine. Uh, I rewatched WNUF Halloween special. Nice. Uh, I like it. I, I like it more and more each year. Like I, the first time I saw it, it was right after watching ghost watch and it's impossible for me to come out with the same level of enthusiasm for WNUF as I do for ghost watch. I really love ghost watch. It's a fucking all timer for me. Uh, and they're very much the same kind of premise of, um, uh, we, we've covered it actually, but, um, a newscast about, you know, haunt a haunted house or whatever going wrong live. Um, and this one, it's got like the cooteriest fucking character in the world, which is Frank. I forget his last name, but the, the, the on location, um, an announcer or whatever is this guy, Frank. And he's like just a shitty petty piece of shit constantly. And that's a lot of fun to watch. And they also intersplice a bunch of like really fake, but like mostly 
pretty on the money commercials that would have passed for like local commercials in the nineties. Um, and it's all run through VHS filters and shit. So it, it, it gives a lot of nostalgia and Halloween vibes. It's still worth a watch. And I like it more every time I see it. Um, maniac cop. I saw for the first time. I really liked that, even though I was not paying full attention because I was also doing some work and I need, I, I want to go back. I'm going to think I'm going to go back soon and rewatch it in its entirety and then maybe ca- catch the other two because I did quite enjoy it. You know, it was not as silly as I thought, or maybe I was just tempered by the fact that I'd seen so many silly movies recently. I had just finished like Halloween town and shit. So, uh, yeah, it was a lot more like on. The, it's rare to see, or I guess for at that time, it seems like it's rare to see Bruce Campbell playing it completely straight. And that was, that was nice to see. I thought he did a great job. Uh, like you said, we watched Elvira and house and haunted Hill last night. Elvira is fabulous. I, I, I really like that movie. It's another one. That's like, seems like it'd be great for kids, except it's the horniest movie of all time. So horny. Like every joke, so horny. but like every joke is like a dad joke level pun, but you can't laugh about it with your kids because it's all centered around cleavage Elvira's <laughs> giant titties. Yeah. Or uh, that one lady sitting on somebody's face. Or- I do. I want to. I want to. This is a total tangent. I'll make it quick. I, this, this past week in the Slack channel, we were making all these like uh, uh, oh puns. Like we were turning like horror movie titles into like porn versions of porn them. Parodies, like, yeah. What what would they be? And my the one that sticks out to me the most is one that you put out there, Randy. And it was the hills have big old tits, and that shit <laughs> killed me. It's that is quite. That's the, I mean, that's the one that's not a pun. That's just, it's, that's why it killed me. That was me. just breaking like, format. Not clever think, at all, but still. Dude, hilarious. I, we did like 400 of those things in like two hours. So many. It was yeah. nuts how many people were, I mean, everybody likes to make a pun. Everybody likes, it's a fucking word game. It's fun. <laughs> I loved it. That was great. Yeah, it was. Uh, let's peg Jessica to death. <laughs> it was my favorite one that I had. Um, that's so uh, fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so last couple things. Uh, I got the new WarioWare game. It's fun. Not much to say there. If you've played a WarioWare game, that's basically what you're getting there, except it's co-op. It's fun. Uh, and then I saw the Mario movie announcement, which made the world collectively shit a brick. And I think... Man, the the Chris Pratt tide has really t- soured, and honestly, it soured for me a while ago. I've, I'm so tired of seeing this man, um, and I just don't really understand the, the logic of doing that stuff. It, it, they're they're making the emoji movie of Nintendo, and I just don't like. I just can't support that shit. It's just, it's too by the numbers. You're kind of like. It's so weird to me that Nintendo is so protective of their IPs to the point where they won't release things that people have been begging for for fucking years. They won't release Earthbound, one of the most beloved series of all time that American never or Earthbound three or Mother three, I guess they call it. Like they're, they haven't released that in the states yet, and all these fucking things that they're so protective of. But the first and second time they pass the reins off to a fucking Mario movie up to people. The first time they go get this fucking wackadoo anti-capitalist fucking Bob Hoskins thing, which is nuts. And I still kind of love for nostalgic reasons. Same. Yeah. And then the second time they kind of go like the most down the middle safe route possible with an animated CG feature. And it's, it's just fucking irritating to see more of these movies come out like that. I, I, I'm tired of movies that are more defined by who's by the list of names on the poster than anything else about it so tired of that shit, especially animated because it's displacing all these really good fucking voice artists. Charles Martinet's in it, but he's not even going to, he's just going to be some like offhanded joke about Mario sounding stupid. Like it just doesn't work anyway. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm big mad about it. Of course, I'm a big baby. I'm crying. I'm crying. I hate it. Um, But yeah, it's, it's just a dumb decision and I'm, I'm just, you know, soured on the whole prospect in general. That's it for me. That's my big complaint moment. Nice. Um, we, what you uh, been watching, Bob? We were talking about Hellfest in the Slack channel, and I was like, man, I hadn't seen Hellfest since it came out, so I threw that on this past week, revisited it. I, I actually enjoyed it more than I remember it, enjoying it uh, when I first saw it. It's basically about uh, this group of teenagers. They go to this theme park, and it's it's all done up like Halloween Horror Nights. They got a bunch of like haunted houses you can walk through. It's very spooky. It's It's you know, Halloween season 
and it turns out there's like a real life slasher in there killing people um and these kids uh, eventually realize that and they're kind of running for their lives um it's got a tony todd cameo in it as well um it's it's treated like pretty seriously it's not it's not super goofy mm-hmm. it's not very tongue in cheek um it's also uh it's very accessible it's on netflix and i think it's might be on amazon too so you you can find it really easily um uh, they handle it well it's like a pretty legitimately good slasher um you know like i've been meat, wanting to watch that potatoes. i've heard I've yeah. heard like like slow building rumblings about that movie. And maybe it's because it's out on Netflix and so more eyes have been on it. Yeah. But it seems like more people have been saying more or less what you just did, which is, you know, this is actually fairly good. It got overlooked when it came out. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty solid. The the characters are like decently developed. It's it's hmm. it's better than you would anticipate, honestly. So, yeah, don't uh if you if you're looking for some like new Halloween related shit to watch this year throw on hellfest like i said it's on netflix it's it's easy to find so it's pretty good yeah um i also speak speaking of like halloween related bullshit i checked out this movie called the barn um this was put out a few years ago i want to say like four four years ago isn't quickly in that too yes yeah she is Mm -hmm. um this was put out by scream team releasing their uh an indie horror movie production house. They've made a few movies. Uh, they made 1031, 1031 part two, handful of other stuff. Um, but it's all like, it's, it's very low budget, very DIY or do DIY, whatever do, do the shit. <laughs> however the fuck you do yourself. Do, it. Do your shit. Um, it's pretty fun though. It's definitely, uh, speaking of like original lore, it's very, it's very much about that. It's about this like haunted barn on Halloween night. And there's like these three demons that, uh, come after you if you like break any sort of Halloween traditions. Um, there's like a, a jack o' lantern. Um, there's a scarecrow, a candy corn scarecrow, and there's like a an evil miner, and they all have their own like bits of lore. And um, there's I had like no idea that was a Halloween centric movie. Oh yeah, yeah, it's all about Halloween. I had no idea, hundred percent. Um, uh-huh. which is which is why I ended up I picked it up. Um, but yeah, it's like it's got a lot of charm to it. It's sort of. It's like kind of like an updated version of Jack O, to be honest. It's like not quite. Well, it's, it's big it's, shoes to fill. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's cheesy, <laughs> but it it knows what it's doing. It's like it's very much riffing. Be prepared on, to be bedazzled. It's riffing on movies like Jack O, you know. But it it, okay. it so it's got this like intentional cheese to it that you may be about you may not be about i don't know it's kind of up in the air it, it, it depends it's all personal taste i thought they did a pretty good job with it um they, they did like an you original gave jacko 2.5 so i mean yeah <laughs> well yeah I, that's this my we'll bias see. Yeah, um, I don't know. I, I dug this movie quite a bit. I would definitely recommend checking that out. I also, for like some very strange reason, like after, after uh, watching that Leonard Skinner documentary, I was scrolling through Netflix and and the Metallica documentary. It's called Some Kind of Monster was recommended to me, and I watched oh it like God. back when I was like fifteen or whenever the fuck that shit came out. And I didn't really care about it then. I was like, I don't know, morbid curiosity. I'll throw this on again, and it's fine like it's if you want to see well, metallica write some very okay music you can do that for two hours i, I don't know i i i remember seeing there's a you know todd in the shadows i've mentioned him before i think mm-hmm. i've posted his stuff on our slack he's reviews music and music related stuff and he does a show called train records which is you know terrible records and he talks about why they failed why they're bad whatever and he did one on what is it my 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 kind of saint anger was saint it? anger is the name of the record saint yeah. anger that's right yeah so and i've never listened to this i'm not a big metallica person so forgive me but i like that he talked about that documentary he's like it's so weird to see a documentary about such a universally hated album <laughs> yeah and the making of it and seeing that it makes perfect sense because these guys are just at each other's throats all the time and does that track for you yeah for sure they go into the writing process uh and they 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 tried to, I, I guess they they were at each other's throats when they were writing a lot of their like hit records, but like half yeah. the band was upset about the writing process and they wanted to get it like more hands on, I guess more involved with it. So they change all that going into it, but also like at this point in time, they're 
like selling out arenas in the mid nineties. They're like the number one rock band. Like they're, they're, they're big shit. And also like James Hetfield had like a huge drinking problem at this time. So like he's battling mm-hmm. with his own demons and uh, like they start writing this record and then he goes away for like a year and a half to rehab and gets his, himself sorted out, which is a great thing. It's, it's a wonderful thing. And then he comes back to finish the record and he can only work like four hours a day and he's like, because I have to spend time with my family, I got to go to my meetings, I have to like really f- mainly focus on like my own personal health, which is like respect, re- respectful, yeah. but like his spectacle, res- it's very respectable, but he's like expecting the rest of his bandmates to like not work when he is not there and they're not about that at <laughs> all. So they have this like uh, counselor come in and he's it's they do like group therapy sessions and it's like. You see them like kind of work through some stuff, but it's very like it all seems very petty. Like v- like the shit that like Lars Ulrich is is like bitching about. It's just like it's very cringe to me. I don't like I don't know why and why would you let anybody film this? I don't know. I I just it baffles me. I, you know that's strange, man. Can I tell you something though? Yes. I you had mentioned that Leonard Skinner documentary to me and I had meant to watch it. So I just wrote down a note here on my notepad and I auto corrected to lanyard skyward. <laughs> That's those are the words you meant to type Randy. You just, I know. love that. And I'm going to start a new rock band called lanyard skyward. Lanyard and we're going to take the world by storm. Uh, some kind of monster. I enjoyed watching it, but it's like not, I don't know. It's just, it's very, it's very cringe. It's very uncomfortable. It's like, fuck no wonder. Yeah. No wonder this record blew honestly it's bad it's it's real bad um last thing i want to mention is i watched the first two episodes of midnight mass which is the new netflix original series Oof, so excited um, to watch that shit. it seems like everybody's really loving it um i like i said i watched two out of seven episodes so far i'm very into it i like what it's doing it the shit's still very up in the air at the second the end of the second episode so like you're trying to get your bearings straight but i'd love the setting and like the character introductions it's it's very engaging and like the acting is solid i'm very excited to finish it so shit man i am excited to check that shit out everybody's everybody's just tripping over their own assholes to praise this thing and guess- they got loose Man. assholes if you're tripping over them. I mean, yeah, they they hang they hang real low. Hang, but um hanging real low. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I I mean, I'm a big fan of both uh haunting on houses at move <laughs> series. <Yeah. laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? I love Flanagan's work. So like this like to to hear that this is like being lauded as like his best work right now by a lot of people is pretty fucking daunting and I kind of want to go and go in with a tempered expectation, but I am getting more and more excited to check this fucking thing out. Yeah. I'm a fan so far. Hopefully I'll finish it up real soon. I don't know. Maybe we'll have to do a mini cast on that. If we, if we, we should it probably, I, probably be worth I it. gotta find the time to finish it, but yeah. 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 We got a lot. I gotta to watch it. lanyard skyward first. Gotta do it. Uh, that's all I've been watching this week. We got one more segment and that is of course our hotline screams. Hotline. <laughs> All right, if you're listening and would like to call and leave a voicemail to be featured on next week's show, hit us up at 904-638-3231. We have a metric fuckload of voicemails this week. We're going to get through as many as we can. Uh, first up, we're going to hear from our boy Brandon. Let's hear what he has to say. Hey boys, uh, Brad and Colin. Uh, I'm just calling in about the uh, question, like sort of to go along with what Miles said about Short Circuit 2. When I first watched that, I mean, my dad, I mean, I'm not, I was born in 94, so I watched that when I was probably like six or seven. My dad was like, oh yeah, I watched these movies when I was younger, like, let's watch that. So we're watching it, and yeah, now yeah, that scene, like, he gets his shit kicked. He's like crying, begging, and I was falling. I was so sad. Like, we had to turn the movie off, I'm pretty sure. And then, like, recently, like, probably like two years ago, I tried to watch it again, and like, I barely got through that scene. I was falling. 
So, I mean, if you want to watch a movie that's going to fuck you up, watch that. Um, but probably even more embarrassing is like five years ago, um, my wife and I, we really love animated movies. Like Disney, Pixar, we'll go to them. So this movie called Inside Out came out. Um, and it's oh, about God. all the emotions that live in this person's head, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And we're in the theater watching this, and, like, we're definitely the oldest people there, other than parents. And then there's this one scene where, like, there's an imaginary friend, and basically they have to, like, it, like, sacrifices itself to, like, help these emotions to get whatever. And, like, I'm falling in the theater, so it's so fucking sad. And my wife turns to me, like, she's my girlfriend at the time, and she turns to me and she goes, are you crying right now? And I was like, fuck off. <laughs> oh, it was so sad. And I'll, like, I'll cry to this day about that. I mean, I'm a bitch when it comes to movies. Like, I cry in majority of movies, but that was something else. So if you guys want to see something that's going to fuck you up emotionally, check that out. Anyways, good shit, boys. Talk to you later. Bob, have you seen Inside Out? I haven't seen either of those movies, Short Circuit Two or Inside Out. Oh, really? Out. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen Short Circuit Two. I guess it's an like a uh, that is not an isolated incident, apparently. Um, but yeah, that scene in Inside Out is pretty fucking sad. It's mm-hmm. very much like it's got like I mean, it, Pixar isn't, does that though. Like they'll they'll throw in a scene that just makes you fucking like weep like a child. Um, because they're, I guess they're just that fucking good at doing that shit. I mean, it it really, and yeah, yeah. This is a children's film fucking up ruined people within the first, like before the opening credits, that movie fucking made people blubbering masses in the theaters. This one did it at least had the decency of waiting till mid movie. I don't know. Good call. Sounds like Brandon's a little bitch. Not really. (laughs) Thanks for calling. Brandon. I'm right there with you, buddy. I cried during the movie Simon Birch, which is a movie nobody but me remembers, but it was a very sad movie. It was a heartwarming movie that ended sadly. I don't think I saw that either. I need to watch more movies, apparently. You you you, you don't need to go with Simon Birch. It's not a movie Deal. that people have to remember. <laughs> uh, next up, we're going to hear from our boy G-Baby. Let's hear what he has to say. Hey, what's up, crew? It's G, baby. Uh, I wanted to call in about a couple prompts from this past week. Uh, first one, uh, where's where's the weirdest place you banged? Uh, so I'm pretty vanilla when it comes to places I've banged. <laughs> but the wildest I've ever gotten is in nature whilst camping. Uh, but the weirdest place I've had sex with myself that's another story uh so i was about 19 so around 2004 uh, i found myself driving back up to northern california from la uh, i was just outside of bakersfield uh staring down about another six hours or so in the car and there's just it's fucking nothing out there boring as drive uh hardly anywhere on the highway um and i was I was fucking super horned up, uh, hormones raging. Like I got hit by like a bolt of horn lightning. Um, so I was just like, I know I can crank one out right now. I'm sure of it. Um, and so I did, uh, <laughs> driving my 86 Buick Regal 70 miles an hour, highway 99 northbound. Uh, and I finished, um, <laughs> not proud of it, but, can say that I've waxed the porpoise on the open road, which should finally cement me in the halls of Cooterdom. So, um, <laughs> what movie terrified me as a kid? That fucking troll fuck from Cat's Eye really freaked me out. So, um, anywho, uh, take care of Mangs, well, Mangs, and children. Keep chilling. Well, hopefully, children aren't listening to that. Um, but may I say, California man strikes again. Yeah, there you go. I, Jim always drops the crazy knowledge on the the sexual related prompts, and I appreciate the hell out of it, man. 
<laughs> yeah, that is some forthright shit, and we re- we respect that around these yeah. parts. Bringing the truth uh, <laughs> to our own detriment. <laughs> yeah, that is fantastic, uh, <laughs> dude. A bolt of horn j- lightning. J- j- Dude, p- playing a little Jacko while you drive 70 down the Pacific Coast Highway sounds like a fucking Cronenberg movie about to happen. Um, yeah. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Th- thank God you did not uh, swerve or anything. Demon or hit me seed. Up. Gee, I don't know, man. Well, thanks, thanks for, G-Babe. Th- thanks for sharing, G-Baby. Next up, we're going to hear from our boy... <laughs> Corey, where does Corey masturbate? Let's find out. Corey, tell us about your masturbatory habits. Bob, you ignorant bitch. <laughs> uh, hey, guys, this is uh, Corey calling about the Calvair episode. Um, I just listened to it last week. And uh, go figure, probably the most surprising thing about that episode was uh, Randy's trigger phrase for me saying, oh, yeah, there aren't stories in the Bible about people fucking cows. Um, which, yeah, so there, there aren't, uh, at least not that I can remember, but for this whole movie potentially being like this view on religion or Christianity, um, there is the story of Moses going up to, uh, Mount Sinai to get the, uh, 10 commandments. And like, basically as soon as he leaves, um, the eyesight of the Israelites, they immediately take all of their gold and cast it into a cow. Um, so I, I think y'all basically hit like all the points or probably most of the points. You just didn't quite realize how well you'd hit them. Um, but yeah, it sounds like, and I have not watched this yet. So just from the podcast, um, it sort of sounds like what happens uh, when people become delusional, like maybe the chick, was almost like a messiah, um, you know, to this uh, village of people. And when she was gone, they just kept trying to insert other things in her place. Um, You know, the cow, like immediately after she is dead, you know, this cow probably became like their um, messiah of their moosiah. I'm sorry. Uh, And (laughs) then once this other guy comes in, I don't know, maybe he looks close enough to the chick where they're like, oh, well, clearly this guy, um, this person is, you know, our Messiah returned. And that's why everyone wanted, uh, wanted him. Um, I can only guess the difference between like the husband and then the village might be the difference between like a mistaken prophet and then just the mistaken people where like everyone is just so far deluded that, you know, they're all imagining that this person is absolutely the second coming of their, you know, whatever the chick represented. So I'm going to give it a watch in the next couple of days and I'll, uh, I'll call back to see if I figure anything else out. But, uh, yeah, keep, uh, keep chilling. So Corey said they put all of their gold inside of a cow, right? N- I mean, no, he's talking about they melted down their gold into the golden calf statue, which oh. they then praised, which is actually a pretty gotcha. pretty good point. And like I was thinking about it here, and like so that combined with, um, I think it was I don't remember exactly, but I think Nicole might have said something to the effect that it's supposed to be. Oh no, it was it was part of Justin's trivia where he was like the director wanted all these characters to be the same character. You know, like they were all like some right, manifestation yeah. of the same character. Yeah. And that like, okay, so this woman was that guy, that one person's God, and this is his subconscious, you know, dealing with that in some way. I guess I could kind of see that. I don't know. This is kind of like going back to a whole, like we're going, jumping in the middle of a pretty deep well there, but yeah, good call. Yeah. I think maybe, maybe some interesting tidbits there. Yeah. That's a good point. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, Corey, definitely. Yeah. Hit us up after you watch the movie and see if, if you come up with anything else. Um, Corey definitely knows more about like biblical shit than I think probably any of us. So that would be a, a useful resource. Uh, here I am thinking they just like rammed all their gold into a cow. That's not the case. Yeah. That's, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's, I'm, it's a graven worship sort of thing. Yeah, like no, that's I'm, why it's on the commandments. <laughs> I, I read that. I know what happened. I know that oh, I, I am oh. right. I know that happened. Uh, Look, I know that happened, and 
Yeah. Can't, I don't know. I don't know where me, I was going with that. Can't tell me nothing. Thanks for calling, Corey. Next up, we're going to hear from Logan. Let's hear what she has to say. What up, Straight Chillin' Crew? It's Logan. Um, I'm probably going to get pushed to next week, which is fine, because I'm waited until I'm on my way to Sunday brunch, but uh, y'all's topic for the past week was the most disturbing kids movie you ever saw. And for me, it would definitely have to be Disney Channel original movie, um, Don't Look Under the Bed, which was fucking horrifying to me as a kid. Um, I think the title kind of speaks for itself, but I definitely still have a hard time thinking that the literal boogeyman is under my bed, so uh, that was a trip. Um, but I've been listening to y'all's uh, top ten episodes, like a bunch of them throughout the past couple of weeks, and the, I've gotten to the 2021 now, and it's so fucking funny um, with the whole jet ski thing that, uh, spoilers, <laughs> that y'all do at the end, it it made me fucking cackle the first time that it happened. I had to pause because like, I was laughing so fucking hard. Um, so, happy spooky season. Happy that we're getting closer and closer, even though we've been already in the semi-spirit since July 5th. Those of you who are truly hard with us. Uh, looking forward to hearing more from you guys, and as always, love to the Slack channel. Where to begin? Wow. Yeah. Uh, what where to chances? begin with that shit? What are the fucking... Ch- that is insane serendipity um, that you she would bring that up and bring the other side of that that discussion. Because that is the reason I watched that <laughs> is because I had heard people like kids had reacted poorly in some way. So I guess I take back what I said earlier. I guess it was really fucking kids up. To me, it, it really didn't seem like it rose to that, but I'm also in my fucking 30s. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've never seen it. I can't speak to it, but apparently it fucked enough kids up that they did pull it. So um, there's got to be something to it, you know. Um, I guess. I it, mean, at least for those kids, there are at least for Logan and her and her, her her sad, sad, stunted brethren. Yeah, I mean the proof is right there. I mean, it fuck, fucked Logan up. Uh, Lo- Logan's On the other mom side, is I think the one that got that shit pulled specifically. She's like, not my baby, not I, Disney. You know, You're pulling that shit. <laughs> It really, I mean, it really must have fucked her up for her to think it was funny that we died and went to hell. I mean, Jesus Christ, Logan, (laughs) have a little empathy, will you? (laughs) That literally happened. We went to hell, but we came back because there's more more movies needed to be reviewed. So here we are. The the world (laughs) needed us. I couldn't say that without laughing. I literally could not. <laughs> Thanks for calling, Logan. Always good to hear from you. Uh, last but not least, we're going to hear from our boy Cole. Let's hear what he has to say. Hey, guys, Canadian Cole. Calling here about cooters. I, now, I've had this thought for a really long time. Like back when there was only four points, you guys were just training us how to be cooter hunters. <laughs> and I've always thought about calling in and, and, uh, and saying this. But then, you know, I says to myself, I says, Cole, don't overcomplicate things. So I wait, and time goes on. You guys get even better at cooter hunting. You bring in the fifth point. You really lock it down. And I think, you know, Cole, they don't need this from you. So I push it down deep, deep into my brain, and I try to forget about it. But then all night of the demons comes along and it's rain and cooters. And I think is it time, but, uh, before I go on, I just want to say quick that I, when I voted for night of the demons, I thought we were talking about the 1980 with a uh, Bigfoot where the guy gets his dick ripped off by Bigfoot. So if you haven't seen that, you should probably go watch that. But anyways, I said, uh, I should get on with my point before I get cut off. Uh, so my idea was each point of the five stars of cooterdom, uh, smug arrogance, sexual dignity, overall looking attire, overall patheticness, uh, manipulation, uh, each category could have like, uh, say three tiers. 
So, for example, uh, Jeremiah Sands would hit a three on overall pathetics. And then at the end, you could count up all their points to decide who's cooter of the week. Now, I don't think this is necessary in every episode or every movie, but when it comes down to you got a whole bunch of cooters and, you know, you got some hit high on, on sexual deviancy, but none of the others, or you get a little bit of each, I think, I, I don't know, maybe I'm overcomplicating it, but I think it can come in handy. Uh, let me know what you guys think. Keep those. Bye. Well, good call. Um, to kind of answer that, I mean, there that was in the mix for a while there. I mean, if, I, if you go back, I think on our Instagram, right? Yeah, Instagram, yeah. On Instagram, Soju took command for a little bit, and it just kind of fell off because we all have, you know, lives, of, <laughs> kind of, um, that we have to attend to. And it basically had a graph that ranked, I think it was on a scale of three per also, um, I don't know like that. I don't know that he did. He, it wasn't like a numeric graph. It was this weird sort of like amalgamation. It was like a five pointed, mm-hmm. like a polygraph, I guess. Graph, I yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe I guess that's probably the best way to describe it. And he would like move the points, like the further out they were, the higher they hit on each point. No, it's not a star it, graph. That's something else. I, I don't know what but, the fuck it's called. No, honestly. but like there was a numerical like component to that because that tells you where the point on the star reaches on that particular branch which is why you would get weird shaped things instead of like filling it out yeah i think he just anyway it's tough to describe like ms paint though i don't think it was no 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 no. he it was a generated thing i'm pretty sure Mm. we'll have to confer with soju and double check show me the money i I don't remember nevertheless Nevertheless, like I, I still think that's kind of a good idea. It's just a really a matter of uh, of time, but also it's a matter of this, which is that uh, despite us trying to nail this down, th- cooter hunting is a lot like mind hunting in that mm. uh, it's more art than science in a lot of ways, <laughs> and a lot of it's pl- a lot a lot of it you're playing by feel a lot. I mean, it's more it's like jazz. It's it's the points you don't play. You know what I mean? It's the points you don't talk about that you don't that you just kind of feel. I was thinking the other day that maybe there's because we were talking about Elvira on the, sh- uh, the the Elvira movie and somebody was like is Elvira a cooter and I was like honestly she kind of hits a few points but I like her too much and I feel like maybe that's kind of its own point on the cooter scale which is like its own sixth spot which is how hateable is this person <laughs> do you hate them because I don't hate I don't, I don't hate Elvira at all I think that shit's badass like she's just being funny to me but she, I mean, sexual deviance, I mean, yeah, <laughs> she manipulates a bunch of high schoolers into painting her house for her and shit. Uh, I don't know. Her looking attire is, is called out frequently. I mean, she would be a cooter on the scale we have now, but playing it by feel, I just don't feel it. I don't feel it. I don't feel it. Yeah, I don't feel it either. I think you can make a solid argument based on the points we have outlined, but mm-hmm. I don't think that would work, though. It doesn't feel right. I wouldn't book her. No, I would not convict. Yeah, that's not a bad idea, Cole. As far as breaking it down, yeah. with like a point system or whatever. But we would ha- we would probably need like a le- a, g- a legit graph, like to post each week or something, which is just more work. I mean, we could talk it out, but then we have to like remember what the fuck we say and stuff, and that's just impossible. We can't do that. We can't do that. We can't do more things, guys. Come on, can't do it. Thanks for calling, Cole. Uh, again, if you want to hit us up. Leave a voicemail to be featured on next week's show. You can do so at 904-638-3231. I kind of want to hear, like, if when you were a kid, did you have anybody doing, like, a little home haunt on your street or, like, a weird thing in the garage? Yeah. Much like in the case of Jacko. Uh, anybody wearing, like, gorilla costumes t- chasing you down the street? I want to hear about that. Share your experiences. I definitely want to hear about that. There was another thing we were talking about prompting but i don't remember what it was <laughs> so that, that's as good as anything yeah call in that's better than nothing and yeah. uh what, what a perfect time to do so because this is our last episode of september next episode is going to Oof. be legit october Oof. spooky pumpkins season. pumpkins oh, pumpkins yeah. Yeah. pumpkins yeah. pumpkins yeah. pumpkins yeah. pumpkins the good shit straight to the vein and we have not to brag on us too much we have a legit schedule lined up for october it is we really do good 
It, we got a lot. I know of that shit. October gets loaded for Halloween or for, for uh, excuse me, for horror fans. And we know that. So, you know, spend your time wisely, but we are going to be providing a lot more shit than we typically do. Yeah. We got a lot of shit coming down the pike and uh, hopefully you guys enjoy it. Hopefully you're along for the ride. Uh, starting with next week's show. Pumpkins. We're going to be talking about the movie called The Guest from 2014. Oh my God. Yeah. It happened anyway. It happened it anyway. Happened. This is the first you from the grave. The, the first you picked the flick from the fourth quarter of 2021. It was chosen by Brandon S. Slam your eyeballs into the guest. Get ready for next week's show. Finally talking about it. Hallelujah. Um, until then, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes. You can follow us on Twitter at str8 underscore chilling, on Instagram at straight chilling podcast. You can send us an email through our website, straight chilling podcast.com. If you want to join in on our daily Slack channel conversations, hit us up on one of our social media outlets and I'll send you a link so you can do so. Don't forget about our Joe Bob live watch party. Don't forget about our Chilloween party. Pumpkins. Don't forget about our pumpkins. And until next week, as always, all you mother truckers, please keep chilling.